Paul asked me a little bit, uh, probably two weeks ago, uh, to share on Romans 3, 1 through 8. That's the passage of Scripture we're going to be in. So if you got a Bible, you can open up to that. And we do have some Bibles around as well. We'll have, some of, we'll have the verses, the main text on the screen, but um, in my typical ADD fashion, we're going to be flying around the Bible as well. So you will need to be handy, and I will call out Scriptures that we're going to go to, and maybe we'll flip to those in a little bit. So Paul asked me... Uh, I don't know, it was probably two or three weeks ago to share. And in uh, typical Travis fashion, I waited till, <laughs> till uh, uh, well, this week I started reading through, but last night was really when I started kind of pouring into it a little bit more. Um, and the awesome thing about it is uh, I had an idea of what I wanted to do with the text, and last night I feel like God just kind of gave me a little bit of a different route, which is part of the reason why I'm pacing so much. I think I, I think I knew where I wanted to go, and yeah, we can handle that. And God's like, no, 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 we're going to try something different. So I, I really appreciated the first song that we sang, Great Is Thy Faithfulness, because that's a lot of what we're going to be digging into, and, and that's kind of the, the heart of this, uh, me, me talking to you guys, hearing from the Word, things like that. So who am I, by the way? That's a good question. Uh, my name is Travis Polk, and uh, I actually typically sit back over here, stand over there with my blue guitar and make lots of racket for Jesus on Sunday mornings. Uh, I lead with Jack Wiest usually, and so today I get the opportunity to be up here and to, to share some things that are kind of near and dear to my heart. So I'm very excited about this. Um, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll dive into this a little bit. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. Uh, great is your faithfulness. Uh, we see your new mercies all the time, and we, we recognize that in our lives. And, and there are times when uh, we know that we're not measuring up, and we know that we're not nailing it. Uh, and God, help us. There are times when we are nailing it. And uh, I think that your faithfulness is there regardless of what we're doing. And I, I really appreciate this text and what you have to say here. And the fact that Paul took the time to kind of detour on this a little bit, that, that this is just kind of his way of reiterating and, and hitting home some real significant points. So as we go through our text today, as we read through scriptures and we look at the Psalms and we look at all these different things, um, and as I'm up here even just talking, that you would be faithful to that that we wouldn't have to worry about what is um, true, what is not, that, Lord, you would just prevent the things that I want to say that are just of me, they're just my own ideas, and that you would only have people hear what is true, what is right, what is holy, what is of good repute. We love you, Lord. Help us love you more. In your name, amen. Well, let's do a little bit of work first uh, before we jump right into three. I feel like ultimately this passage really should be kind of refreshing. Um, a little bit of a, a thing on Paul, and I think we've seen it already through Romans and in some of the other letters that he's written. Paul likes to preempt what, what the, the reader might be thinking, and so he asks many rhetorical questions, and we're going to see this throughout the rest of Romans as well, and it's no different that we're going to see it here today in, in chapter 3. And so... What I like about Romans, and one of the reasons we decided to jump into this as a church, I think Doug kind of gave the initial address about why we want to go through this as, as a church and spend so much time on this book, is because Romans really is kind of the most succinct, best overall description of Christianity. What do we believe? Why do we believe it? Those types of things. And so um, he writes this letter to the Romans after he's really been a Christian, for, an apostle, I should say, for, for quite some time. And so he's, he's come up against, whether we have it documented or not, he's actually come up against um, Pharisees, Jews, and stuff like that. So all these questions that he's going to be asking are not born out of his own, like Paul's just gone on in the schizophrenic whatever. Like he's, he's, he's thought about this. He's probably had lots of these conversations with other people, which is probably why he gets so excited about some of the things that he shares so we're going to do the last part of two, walking into three first. And I wanted to talk just briefly about circumcision. Um, I was looking at some of, and my notes are all scattered. So some I'll read, some I won't. I have no idea what we're going to do today, but the Lord hopefully will bless it. Um, but I, I've, I looked at lots of different things. I looked at Piper, I looked at Sproul, I looked at some other guys. Just what do they have to say about this passage? And so if I don't, side note, I'm in school right now, so I have to cite everything. Like if I say something and it's like not my own original thought, like I have to quote it or I'm plagiarizing and kicked out of school. So if I do not 
give credit to whom credit is due in this time. Please forgive me. The Lord will understand and you'll, you'll figure it out. So um, I think one thing's going to be certain. We'll know what's the Bible and what's Travis. So at least we'll have that. All right. So in uh, Deuteronomy 36, you don't have to go there if you don't want to. But I think it's important to talk just a little bit about circumcision because Paul keeps talking about circumcision. And so I'm trying to figure out what went wrong here. So this is Deuteronomy 30. This is kind of God talking to the Israelites about some of his law. I'll start in five. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land of your father, that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. And so in the Old Testament, before Paul's even talking about circumcision of the heart versus what's physical, God has said that this is something that he does in the heart, even though it's manifest in a physical way. And so it's really important to understand that, that God is, from the jump, more concerned about um, the reality of what circumcision is supposed to be as opposed to the sign of circumcision. But somewhere along the way, Jews and specifically Pharisees being very diligent about following the law, this became just as much about obedience and about fulfilling the law, and actually much more about obedience and fulfilling the law than it was about this actual outward reality of a change of heart. And so that's kind of what Paul's going to attack here a little bit. So let's go back to Romans 2. And I'm just going to reiterate just a little bit of what Paul shared last week. We're going to do 25 for circumcision is indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So what is he saying? He's saying that circumcision is a fine thing as long as you keep the law completely. If you break the law, then not even your circumcision is going to kind of cover up for this thing. So he's kind of talking to the Jews right now. Verse 26, so if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, Will not his uncircumcision be regarded? So now what he's saying, he's starting to set apart from the law, saying that even though these people over here, the Gentiles, are not circumcised, but have an idea and, a, and, and an understanding and an obedience of the precepts of the law, does their uncircumcision actually become circumcision? So now he's starting to level the playing field. And the one thing Paul mentioned last week that I want to reiterate again is that he goes one step further. Uh, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision. Verse 27, then he who is physically uncircumcised Gentile, but keeps the law, will condemn you who have the written code, the Jews who have the law. So the teachers now are going to be condemned because the people that are uncircumcised don't have the law, don't have any of that stuff, are keeping the precepts of the law, they understand the gospel, and so that now is going to, they're going to be the judges of the Jews. Now, if this is going to make them seethe, um, if anything is going to do that, this is going to be it, because the Jews are righteous. They are holy. They do have the commandments of the Lord. And so um, this is going to really strike a nerve with them. Paul continues on, and this is important for leading into three. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. Pray, and his praise is not from man, but from God. So now Paul's going to go ahead and take a right here. So he's laid this down and said, hey guys, in God's eyes, there's no difference between Gentiles and Jews, none, zero. And the Jews are a little bit frustrated by this, number one, because there's some pride, but also we look at history and say, but my goodness, we're, we were God's chosen people. We, like, certainly, there's, certainly there's a benefit, certainly there's a blessing, certainly there's something special about being a Jew. Paul, you can't just say that we're the same now and that, that, that there's nothing special at all about the Jews. And so Paul goes ahead and, and addresses this rhetorical question because, again, he's probably talked to the Pharisees somewhere in Ephesus about this. I made that up. So um, verse 3. Now we're going to get into the text. What advantage, then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. 
So it looks like he's going to start this whole list of, there's a lot of things that are really awesome about Jews. Let me start by saying this, and we'll go into that. And, and actually, when we read, you'll find that there's only one thing that he mentions. So he says, much in every way, this one thing. And um, as I, I was listening to, to John Piper, and we're actually going to get into it, Romans 9, I think, is where he continues the list. So he, he just throws this out there on his detour, gets back on the path, and then down the road, maybe December when we get to 9. I'm joking. I don't know. Um, so that's, that's when he'll pick up the rest of the list. So much in every way, it's not only this, but this is the biggest thing that he's going to talk about. So he says, much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So the oracles of God, and I think you guys all understand that to mean the Bible, the words of God. And so the Jews were given the words of God. They were entrusted with, even as it mentions up here, the written code. So the Jews were given that initially. They had that, and it was their responsibility to pass it down verbally and even write it in some instances to to make sure we have the Bible that we have here today. And so I think it's important to understand that, that what Paul's saying here is not that like when we think of an advantage, we think of, uh, I was actually trying to explain this to my kids the other day. You want to test your understanding of scriptures or even the English language, try to explain a word to your kids sometime. So I'm thinking about advantage. I'm like, it means advantageous. It means to, to be, it, it means to have an advantage. I don't know, son. So, so, so we have this idea of, of advantage. We know that it means there's a benefit. It means like you got a head start in the race. There's, there's something that you're bigger, stronger, whatever it is, there's, there's an advantage that you have. And it's really important to understand that Paul just said there's no difference at all. And then now he's saying that there's an advantage. How can those two be there? And then actually, and I'm not going to talk about this week, but in verse 9 it says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. So then he reverts back. You're like, what are you talking about, man? So the advantage here that I kind of see is that there's actually privilege in being a Jew. It's not that there's anything better. There's not a hierarchy. There's not something that God has set up to say that that this is it. It's it's privilege. It's benefit in being Jews. Um, And he wants to highlight those things, but specifically he's talking about the oracles of God and being entrusted with that and passing that on and that being a very big responsibility to handle the word of God. And so it's easy to see why the Jews may have thought over the years how they kind of ascended to this position of well, we have the word of God after all, and uh, we are quite awesome. But then if you go back to kind of think about, well, where did the Jews come from? I mean, were they this special set-apart group of people over here that God was kind of holding off for himself? And he's like, okay, now they're all ready. I'm going to give them the word of God and move on from there. No, they didn't exist at all until God decided that they were going to exist. And he was going to carve them out of a group of people and say that these are now mine. So... There was nothing special about the Jews other than what God gave them. And so it's important to realize, I think it's very important to realize that throughout Scripture, that there's really no special people. So the Jews, all born out of Abram. Who is Abram? A dude. Just a guy that God said, hey, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to create this whole group of people out of you. Okay, that's pretty cool. So who was Moses? A baby in a basket <laughs> that God set apart, pulled out, put into a position of authority and power, called out to lead his people. By the way, refused it and didn't want it. And what was special about Moses this much? What's special about Moses? Other than what God ascribed to him. God said, you're going to lead my people. And so now God has ascribed him and made him special. How about Mary? She was favored because she was given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave her the baby. So she was favored among women because she was going to carry Christ. So Paul, let's keep going. Like, so what was special about Paul? He was breathing threats against the church. He hated the church. He was going to kill all the Christians. He was railing against them because he was vehement about the law. And God Roundhouse kicked him off his horse and said, now you're going to follow me. And so in all these moments, there's nothing necessarily special about these people. And so uh, the Jews started out as not special, became special because God loved them, carved them out, gave them the words. And then somehow along the way, they got proud about that. They got proud about what God gave them. And so then that began, that's why we have Romans now. (laughs) You're not as awesome as you think. And so I was thinking about that as we kind of go through is that 
that's really helpful. It's not that, that God is sitting up there in heaven and saying, okay, I really need to reach Greeley, but I have to have a dynamic speaker. Who can I use? I got it. Paul's going to do it. I got it. Doug's going to do it. You know what I mean? Like, like God's not up there trying to figure out who's on my team. Who can I pick? Um, that God is the one that makes people special. God is the one that empowers. God is the one that allows you to use your gifts and abilities that were given by him. So I think it's really important for, and that is refreshing. That isn't meant to be one of those, so you guys all, I almost said another word, are horrible. <laughs> I'm learning to bridle my tongue a little bit. So, um, so the code was given to them. They're not necessarily that special. They're acting like they're special, but Paul is saying, no, but this is a privilege. This is a benefit you have. Well, what is the benefit? That they're given the oracles of God. So verse 4, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. All right, so let's chat about that for a minute. So, you know, there's, there's actually a number of different ways people kind of take that. Um, uh, one pastor was talking about how the, the Jews were God's chosen people, and if some of them actually didn't believe in the Christ, then does that make God unfaithful? I don't know if that's right or not. It seems like in context, since he just said the Jews were given and entrusted with the oracles of God, that some were unfaithful. What if, like he's postulating the question, what if some were unfaithful with it? I'm wondering if he's actually talking about the written word of God. So what if some Jews took lots of liberties in there? What if they decided that, hey, you know, we could also write this in here, and that would also, you know, elevate our status a bit. You know, that, that what if some of the Jews were unfaithful to the thing that God gave them with, with his oracles, with his word, with his code, and his response to that is just very simple and very straightforward. He says, by no means, let God be true, though everyone were a liar. And that's, that's a very strong statement. And if we're honest, I think sometimes it's really hard to swallow. Um, I think oftentimes we feel like, we, we need to be faithful to something. We need to do something in order for, for God to be able to accomplish things that, that, again, he's kind of sitting up in heaven saying, oh, I really hope Travis takes a right here instead of a left. Please, 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 please. Like, like there's, there's nothing about what I'm going to do that's going to really jack up God's overarching plan for, for his purposes, that he's going to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Like, we postulate, what if Moses actually stood his ground and said, no, God, I'm not going to go. I think he would have missed out on the blessing and probably someone else would have been raised up. God is not going to be like, oh no, the Israelites are still in Egypt. That's horrible. Like, it, like God's faithfulness is predicated on God, not on you. And I was thinking about that even as I was pacing in the back. I was talking to my son on the way in. What makes me nervous about this is not necessarily being up in front of people. It's, it's saying things that are right and true and um, feeling like like I can derail or mess things up or whatever. And so as I'm thinking about that, God's like, hey, do you remember what you're talking about today? <laughs> like, I don't know. So there's this whole idea that, that God is going to be faithful. He's going to be faithful in spite of you. That he's going to be faithful in spite of where you've messed up, in spite of where you've excelled. He's going to be faithful to what he said he's going to be faithful to. And likewise with the scriptures. He didn't mess it up. This is the word that he wants us to have. And there wasn't all these things that were messed up through the years because Jews just decided they were self-important and the best things that have ever been created. And so God is standing by it right here. And one thing that he, he jumps right to is uh, this passage right here, the second part of verse 4, says that, um, so it says, Let God be true, though everyone were liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words, and prevail when you are judged. And um, I was thinking about that, that section there a little bit. And when I first came across it, it didn't necessarily make sense to me. But then um, when you look at where it came out of, um, it actually comes out of Psalm 51. And I want to do a little bit of work with that. I want to I I talk about Psalm 51 just a little bit. And, and even 2 Samuel. So we're going to flip over. If you guys want to go to... Psalm 51, keep your finger there, or just look at the screen, whatever. Uh, Psalm 51, put a finger there, and then when I flip over to another place where you're getting there. 
I have to remember where it is. All right, so we're going to use to, um, uh, Psalm 51. So this was written right after, um, right after uh, David is confronted by Nathan, okay? So let's do a little bit of rehash, and I'm going to have to uh, paraphrase that because I didn't put a bookmark in there. I forget if it's 16 or whatever. It's basically 2 Samuel. So uh, if you remember, David, who's a Jew, who's a king, um, not going to war like everybody else is, chilling on his rooftop, sees a awesome-looking woman, decides he needs to make her his, and she ends up getting pregnant. Ouch. Um, tries to trick Uriah, who is actually her husband, come back from war. Uriah is actually one of his mighty men, like a stud on the battlefield for him. Comes back, tries to trick him. Hey, go sleep with your wife, please, quickly. Um, and that doesn't happen because Uriah has a lot of character, even more character drunk than David did sober. Read it all. It's all in there. I'm not making any of this up. So um, sends Uriah back out with his own death note pinned to him, and he kills Uriah. Okay, so he's committed adultery. He's killed the man. He's taken Bathsheba in as his own. Enter Nathan through God to speak to David. And he says to him, he says, hey, I got a quick story for you. All right, this is paraphrased. Gosh, I'm, I apologize. I was going to read this to you. So um, got a quick story for you, David. Just top of your head. What do you think about this? There's this guy that has a sheep, and he loves this little lamb, and he feeds it, and they drink out of the same. They eat their Cheerios together in the morning. They love each other. It's a great thing. They snuggle up at night together, and he loves this lamb a lot, raised it, everything like that. Likewise, there's this really rich dude over here, has lots and lots and lots and lots of sheep and more sheep than you can count. And he's got a traveler that's coming to visit him, right? And so the visitor's very hungry and stuff, and so he wants to eat lamb because lamb's delicious. And so uh, the, this guy says, you know what? Perfect. Let's go ahead and do that. Hey, uh, poor guy with the only one lamb. Can, you, can I borrow that for a minute? <laughs> Kills a lamb. Feet. That was too graphic. I apologize. There's kids in here. So, um, kills the lamb. They have some lamb stew and such. And uh, David is livid, livid at this. He's like, who's this guy? Not only will I kill... All right, so I'm not going to go into that because I'll get in trouble if I start talking. But what, what he says is basically, this guy deserves to die. And uh, Nathan says... That's a good point. I hadn't thought about that, David. It is a good point, isn't it? And so you are the king, David. And he immediately knew. He immediately knew what he was talking about. See, sin had blinded him before, but he immediately knew, immediately knew what he had done wrong. Nathan says to him, you're not going to die, but your son's going to die. And so Psalm 51 was created out of this. This is David's lament for this. And Psalm 32 is speculated by some to be out of this as well. So what I want to do is I want to do 51. We're going to read most of it here, okay? So Psalm 51, 1, and then later on we're going to touch on 32. Verse 1, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your works. So that's verse 4 right there is what is highlighted in Romans 3. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. We'll stop right there. So his, the judgment was, your son's going to die. And, and actually, it's a great story. If you read the rest of it, actually, maybe it's 12. If you read the rest of it, um, it's a great story about how David still pleads on behalf of his son to, to live. And then his son dies, and he, he rejoices. He worships the Lord uh, in spite of that trial. And, and again, this song kind of comes out of that. And he's saying that you're justified in your actions and you said this was going to happen, and this is a natural punishment for sin, and so I'll, I will take that. So he says, you're, you're blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth, in inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice 
Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. And then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth and will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice where I would give it. Now, this was written at a time when they still did sacrifice, right? So somehow David understands that there's something more at stake here. Somehow he gets it. Maybe that Holy Spirit thing. Um, It says, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Verse 17, very important. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken, contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. And so, that's kind of David's plea right there. And so, so verse 3 over here, or not verse 3, verse 4, when he says that you're that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged, that God is going to stand apart, that God is going to be holy in spite of our, our, our sinfulness. And so again, Paul's going to step in, and he's going to assert that there's probably people out there that have questions pending on this, because they would be familiar with David's passage. They would be familiar with the Old Testament. They'd be familiar with those words right there. And so he says in verse 5, But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. All right, let's talk about that for a minute. And honestly, we're going to come to that passage again in Romans 6, I think, um, where we're going to talk about uh, grace and God lavishing grace on people and what that looks like. So um, what's going to happen here is I learned a new word. You guys ready for a $10 word? This is a great word. It's called sophistry. Yeah. Who's some, got some Piper fans out there? All right. So sophistry is simply this. It's uh, the use of fallacious, or, or, so fallacious arguments, especially with the intention of deceiving. And so what's happening here is there, it's like philosophy. Any of you guys ever taken a philosophy class? What is, is. I don't know. Why are we talking about this? It is. I don't know. So what happens is you, you take lots of truths and you start to put them together and then you can fabricate using lots of truths something that's kind of weird and very deviant than what was initially said and what common sense, though it may not be as common as it once was, is, is over here. And so there's a way we look at something and say, all right, Is that actually right? So what they're going to do is now we're going to start playing word games. And again, Paul has probably had this argument with somebody, although nobody is specifically fighting with him. He's he's trying to preempt some things. So, but if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? And then is actually God righteous in condemning the world? So the, the point is this. If when we sin, God's grace covers us, and God's grace actually is what glorifies and honors him, and he enjoys pouring that grace out, then shouldn't we just sin all the more? And shouldn't we just, I mean, if sin highlights God's glory, then why would we want to stop sinning? Because we want to glorify God, right? And if we sin more, God gets more glorified. Surely God can't crush and condemn people that are just glorifying him, can they? And so there's this way of kind of grabbing words and playing with them like, whoa, wait, where did you just go? And um, so Paul responds to this, and and there's actually two different ways that I want to go with this. I I want to talk about the fallacy itself, but I want to talk about Paul's response to it, because he actually just grabs their word game and kind of keeps running with it, and we'll we'll touch on that in in just a minute. Um, Again, the idea is that the worse you look, the better God looks. So the best example I could think of is, uh, let's say Bill Gates comes into town, we're good friends. And so what if I took him out to lunch or whatever? Okay, you're not going to take him out to lunch. Hey, Bill, this one's on me. Uh, Thanks. No problem. Versus 
and this is just if we're looking at strictly from a human perspective, versus if I decided to take a homeless person or went to Guadalupe Shelter and got some people together and took them out or the Texas Roadhouse or whatever they desire. So I, I would look better, right? The worse the person looks, the better I look when I help or when I show mercy, right? So that's kind of what they're trying to paint this picture of is that the worse you are, the better God looks. So Paul's pretty frustrated with that. And so he jumps right down in here and he says, and we'll read, so that God is unrighteous to to inflict wrath on us. So God would be unrighteous in crushing and inflicting wrath on people that are just glorifying him by their excessive sin. By no means. For how could God judge the world? Now, it's important that he would say that because you remember that the Jews wanted the world to be judged, right? They, they are holy, they keep the law, and they wanted judgment to come. And so what he's saying here is, well, wait a second, if sin just augments how awesome God is, then um, how, how is he going to actually judge the whole world? And the Jews would be like, dang it. That's a good point, I don't know. Because if everybody's just sinning, then everybody's just glorifying God by their argument. Verse 7, but if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? So then Paul kind of takes it to a bit more personal level because the Jews in his history um, did not like the gospel that he was bringing. They did not like the idea that the law, that this was just a continuation of what Jesus brought, that the law was not a means of salvation, that it was not going to be the end-all, be-all, that it was just simply to show you that you're a sinner in need of Jesus Christ. They didn't like that. They didn't like that at all. And so Paul's saying here, but if through my lie, meaning that, I mean, he's being facetious, right? Through my lie, remember, I'm saying that the law is not legit. So through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory. Through my sin, if God gets glory, then why am I being condemned as a sinner by you guys? I mean, if your argument is the worse I look, the better God looks, then preach on, Paul, right? Preach on that heresy. That's great. You're just making God look awesome. Of course they don't want that either, right? So then there's the last one here. And then what? Yikes. Am I grounded? I'm not shocking myself. All right. Um, Verse 8. (laughs) <laughs> and why do not and why not do evil that good may come as some people slanderously charge us with saying that their their condemnation is just and so again some people are saying that well if you don't live by the law paul then you're just telling everybody they can just live like you can just do whatever you want to do and that's just not it that's just not how it's supposed to be and so he's the, these people are accusing Paul of saying that that's the gospel. That's what it is. You guys can do whatever you want. And God just said, no problem. That's no problem. We'll fix that too. You can live however you want to. And he's saying that that's not the truth. That's not the way it is. And so um, it's, it's um, he's saying their condemnation is just in that passage there. And when I was listening to John Piper talk about this, he, that's kind of where he started with their condemnation is just. I mean, that's a pretty strong statement that Paul just levies against this imaginary person <laughs> or whoever's reading the letter on the other side. Their condemnation is just. Whose condemnation? The condemnation of the one that kind of messes with the word of God. The one that kind of um, takes little bits of truths here and there and tries to compile it in a way that makes them look better or that uh, builds a case for what they believe. And so he's saying, be very, very, very careful when you look at the scriptures and when you look at things that don't seem to make sense and when you can't, you can't reconcile this truth of God with this truth of God, that you can't just abandon one for the other, that you got to see in scriptures kind of how they come together. And so he's saying that in all of that, you're just foolish, You're just making foolish, dumb arguments. They don't even make sense. They don't hold water. They don't hold weight. And again, we're going to get to this again. Paul is not done talking about this one. He'll get back to it in Romans 9. But when I was was reading through this and I was thinking about it, um, a lot of what God's been laying on my heart these days 
has been um, just, just the weight of sin and seeing what the weight of sin does uh, to people in my life and kids and work and, and everywhere and seeing, seeing how that kind of plays itself out. So what happens here is if the worse we look, the better God looks, it seems like there's this kind of, isn't that a win-win, God? I mean, we get a sin and do everything that we want to do, and you look awesome. I mean, shouldn't that just be the way it is? I mean, that seems like a real win-win situation. And Paul just goes ahead and just grabs their argument and runs with it and then just destroys it that way. When I was looking at it, I was thinking about it this way. It's not necessarily a win-win. Um, if we look back at um, what sin does and how people are affected by that, I think we forget that the God's just not up in heaven saying, that looks like it's fun. You should stop doing that. Um, like he's not this big kind of ogre in the sky that just wants you just to worship me, worship me, and I promise it'll be fun eventually. Like that's, that's not what he's about, that there's something about sin that actually hurts you. There's something about sin that actually drives wedges in relationships with other people and even with him. And so what's interesting about this, and if we go back to kind of the, the, the passages that, that were talked about in Psalm uh, 51, specifically in verse 17, it says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. And this is, again, this is Old Testament. This is not a New Testament thing. It's, it's Old Testament. And so I don't think God's glorified by our sin. Where he's glorified is when repentance ensues, right? Because God, God wants us to be repentant. He wants us to hate sin. And he knows that we're in that sanctification process, that, that once you're justified, you get a whole many, 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 many years of sanctification before you get to glorification, and so part of that process is sin, repentance, sin, repentance, sin, repentance. And so God is not saying that you should be sin-free. What he's saying is that, I think what he's saying is that ultimately God is glorified in a person with a contrite heart and a broken spirit coming back to him. And that's what, that's what David's doing in that. And that's why it's quoted in that section right there, that, that David is coming before God in a broken, contrite way. And so um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to read over here in Psalm 32, and I'm just going to read part of it. I don't know how much I'm going to read, but we're going to read some of it. So start, Psalm 32. This is a cool side note. I don't know if all your Bibles have it in there or not, but it says, a mascal of David. A mascal is, it actually sets the psalm apart. Maybe I'm butchering that. Maybe there's a better way to say that. But mascal, we're in America. So... Um, Maskell is a psalm that is intended to teach. So anytime you see that in the psalms when it says a maskell or something along those lines, that that is intended to be a teaching psalm. There's actually a lesson being taught through this, okay? So again, there's some people that surmise that Psalm 32 was written after uh, David lost his son and um, after the, the uh, Bathsheba-Uriah incident here, okay? So... Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered by the blood of the Lamb. May remember that song? No. We used to sing that a lot. Okay, I apologize. Let's get back to Jesus. So, blessed is the man whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Verse 3, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. You may know what Selah means? Stop and think. Stop and ponder. Stop and rest. And so there's a reason that's there. And so we should not move on. We should stop and think about this for a second. Let's reread it. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Speaking of the period of time from when he had Uriah killed to when Nathan approached him. Quiet, silent, unspoken sin. 
secret sin. And it says the Lord's hand was heavy upon him. And that all day long he felt like his bones were just wasting away. And um, that is God's grace. That is God's grace that he would press you. That he would discipline those he loves. That he would scourge every son that he receives. That he would not allow you to just let that be under rug swept. That he would actually draw you out and draw you to repentance. That is the grace of God that's in those chapters, those verses right there. Let's move on to verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. So, good. so he decides there's no more being quiet. Now he's going to acknowledge the fact that he's sent. He's sent, whatever. That he's sinned. And with the help of Nathan and God to show him that he sinned. Because remember, David was blind to that. Nathan's busting out this thing. Hey, David, does this sound strangely familiar? Nah, let's kill that guy. Like He has no idea that that he's the man in the parable there. That sin has blinded him so much to that. And we see that, right? Don't we see that there's there's the gross... So I work in the ER, male nurse, right? So, So in the ER, we can see the effects of sin. We can see that someone that's not their stated age, maybe has had a real rough life. Lots of alcohol, lots of drugs, lots of smoking, lots of whatever, untreated chronic disease. Like um, sin, physical sin, outward rebellion has its toll physically on somebody. It has it emotionally. It has its toll physically on someone as well. And you can look at that. You can look at someone and say... I bet they had fun in the 60s. Like you can just tell kind of that, that that's maybe their demeanor. And it, it also takes its toll on the body when it's secret and hidden. And I feel like maybe even more so sometimes. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail about this story, but recently um, I know of a guy that, that's, that's had some real, real, real egregious stuff come out about his life. That was secret for years and years and years and years and years. And uh, my heart goes out to him, and I, I want to I wanna talk with him someday if that's possible. God would set that up. But I ran into him before any of this came out. I ran into him just in passing one time, and um, he just had aged so much. He was, he's, he was always kind of a, a skinny dude, and he just had put on weight. He was gray. And his countenance was just dropped. There was just something about him that was so wrong. And, and now, if we fast forward a few years, we know exactly what it was. And so we know that sin takes its toll on us, too. And, and that is still God's grace to say, my hand is heavy, and I will not let you get away from this. And so we've talked about it before. I really feel like secret sin is one of the biggest killers in the church. If, if there is anything that we hear today... <laughs> That we would, we would confide in another brother. That we wouldn't just take it to the Lord, but another brother, another sister, and say, this is where I'm falling short, because I promise you they are too. Everybody is messed up here. Yeah. And, and um, we all have these secret little things that we think, okay, what I'll do is I'll just take care of it first. I'll just kind of clean it up some, and then we'll maybe talk about it. And then we can talk about it in a way that's in the past. I used to struggle with this a long time ago, a couple weeks. Um, and... Uh, I just wanted to bring that before you. It's not an issue anymore for the last couple of days. And so I just wanted to, to bring, I mean, just to be open and honest with you, right? We can be 98% known, and that 2% still makes us very much unknown. So I would implore you guys, if there's anything like that, please, please talk to somebody. Please let it out. Don't let sin continue to devour you and eat you. We talked about sin blinding you, um, and that's why it's helpful to have a body of believers that can help you see your sins and where you fall short. And not as a take the Bible and slap you with it all the time. That's not the point. But just to kind of help us mutually. How do we, how do we move towards Jesus together? So repentance is a, is a big, 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 big part of how God is glorified. Sin exists, yes. But sin doesn't serve to show that God's glorified and honored. Repentance of sin shows and augments and highlights God's grace. And... Um, so I think that's the point. I think that's the point of kind of the, the end there. And, and like I said, there's any number of directions that we could have gone with this passage, and lots of, of speakers have. But I really felt pressed to share those things. 
um, sin is real, and, and none of us are above it. I was talking to Paul just prior to, to coming up here. Like, I have never been so painfully aware of how not awesome I am. <laughs> and nobody really wants to admit that. You don't even want to admit to the fact that you were thinking that you were at one point until God just kind of shows you something. Like, man, I cannot kick this. Like, why is it around every single corner? And why does it hurt so much every single time you gently kick that pedestal right out from under my feet? And, and again, that is God's grace. That is God's love to, to bring you back to that broken, contrite spirit. And please don't hear me say that that's God, the oppressive father, to say, oh my gosh, they're popping their heads up again, <laughs> just whacking a mole all, the, all over the place. That's, that's, not, that's not as hard either. It's hard as to draw you back into himself, to draw you back into himself, to draw you back into himself, to show you who he is. That's the point of sanctification. And that's what it is. And so at the end here, that's how God is glorified. And so we're going we're gonna to close here. Um, as we do pretty much every Sunday. I'm going to pray for you guys. And what I want you to do is I just want you, I want you to pray. If you want to pray with someone around you, that's fine. If you want to pray to yourself, um, that's totally fine as well. But maybe we don't pray today. Maybe you just kind of examine yourself secretly. Maybe you just kind of search yourself for secret sins. Or maybe as soon as I said that, you knew exactly what it was. Um, maybe there's someone you can talk to. Maybe... Maybe that person's not here yet. Maybe that person's in another state. I don't know what it is, but watch sin too much kill, destroy relationships, destroy people, and pull God's flock apart. And so I'd implore you guys today, just just think about it. Just think about what what are the things that I'm dealing with and, and how am I dealing with them? Am I trying to trust in my own self to do this? Am I trying to figure it out first so that I can go and then be about God's work? When God just said, I'm faithful because I'm faithful, not because you're not doing this anymore. God wants to help you out of this. And I don't know that we can expect to ever be perfect at all uh, in any of these sins that plague us. But we certainly can perfect this whole idea of repentance and keeping short accounts and going back to the Lord and seeking forgiveness for those sins. So let me pray for you guys. And then uh, we'll just spend some time praying to yourselves, if you want to, with somebody around you. And the band's going to come back up and and lead us in a time of uh, reflection. Father God, you're faithful. You're faithful in spite of my faithlessness. You're faithful when I'm killing it. You're faithful when I am not. That's really hard for me to swallow sometimes, Lord. Maybe there's other people in here that, that, that are dealing with the same thing. I, I, I wanted, it's so bad to want to just grab it by the horns and just succeed and just take care of business. And it's okay, God, you hang out on your throne. I'll take this some for you. And, and that's not, there's no satisfaction in that. There's no glory in that. There's just my own building up. And that's not what you have, Lord. So I thank you that you're faithful to come along and to, to reveal for us who we are. Not that we can become this self-loathing person, but that we know who exactly who we are so that we can see you for who you are and let the gospel penetrate so much deeper into our souls. I pray that this would not be rhetoric this morning, that this would not just be another, oh, another confess your sin speech. But, um, but maybe there's something that comes of it, Lord. Maybe there's something you really are tugging on people about. Maybe there's, there's really something that you want to highlight I thank you, Lord, that you're faithful to us. I thank you that you say even in um, uh, 1 Peter that you are going to continue to perfect the work that you started, Lord, that you started a work in us as believers, and you will perfect it. You'll perfect it when we are doing well, and you're honoring and saying, yes, that is great. You're using the gifts I've given you to glorify and honor me, truly, to when we're not using the gifts to glorify and honor you, and you show us that. Thank you that we have your word. Thank you that we have um, the Holy Spirit that lives on us. And I thank you that we have relationships around us that can help us on this path. Lord, I, I want to know you more. I want to know you more. I want to know who you are. I want to know what you think. I want to know everything about you. And, and yet, at the same time, I look at my own shortcomings about what I, I read and what comes into my mind and then... In turn, what comes out? What is the overflow of my heart? I pray you just refresh us, Lord. That this morning you just refresh us. That that the word that was spoken this morning would would touch, would clean people's hearts. It's in your name we ask the
Lord, is Lucas Place.